Welcome to the Better Than Success Podcast, where we teach you, entrepreneurs, business owners, and the aspiring, how to teach yourself the art of success. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, Nikki Purvey. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Better Than Success podcast, and I am your host, Nicole Purvey, and I am really excited to bring this episode to you because I'm excited to bring every episode to you, but the person I'm going to interview is my very close mentor, and some of you have been introduced to him already, but I'll get to that in a minute. Before we get into that, you know, I have some housekeeping items for you. So by the time that this episode airs, we will have been moved into our new office. I have hope that we will be in there. So for all of our members of the Better Than Success Real Estate League, make sure you make note of our new office location, 2930 Jasper Street, number 103. And if you are not a member and you are thinking about coming to one of our events that we have coming up, that's if you're thinking about coming to our mastermind, our real estate mastermind, every Wednesday at 7 p.m., make sure you go to that address. And if you are coming to our Philadelphia Real Estate Week planning meeting on November 30th at 6 p.m., that is where you want to go. Now, some of you, this is your first time hearing about that, and so let me just remind you, let me just tell you, we are planning Philadelphia Real Estate Week June 4th through the 9th, and it is going to be a citywide celebration of real estate investing, urban planning, and home buying and sales. And we're planning on having tons of event, events that week. We are partnering with the city of Philadelphia. And I'm really excited. And I want you to be there and be in on the planning. Like, this is where you can get in and, like, control some things, make some decisions. You can even host your own event. So make sure that you are there November 30th at 6 p.m. But you got to RSVP first. Go to phillyrealestateweek.com and RSVP so that you can get on the list because our new office, our security is tight, tight, tight. Security will be tight. So be sure that you are on the list for that. And um, I think that's really, I don't want to inundate you guys with, um, my mom gave me like a little bit of a tongue lashing the other day. Like Your uh, announcements in the beginning are so long. I don't know if I feel that way because I know almost everything, but... (coughs) So I'm going to try to cut it back for you guys and just give you like the really important things. Just also a reminder, make sure that you pick up the book, The Anti-Hustle at theantihustlebook.com, how to get the six figures uh, in your business in the first year. So make sure you pick up the book. So I'm going to just get right into this interview. It's going to be a good one. I know it. I know with all my heart. So, okay, I'm going to read off my guest bio and we'll do our normal thing. I'll let him recap himself after I read off his bio. So my guest is Ryan Boyer. Ryan Boyer is the business manager for the Labor's District Council of Philadelphia and Vicinity. He is the chairman of the Delaware River Port Authority. He is also the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and the Philadelphia Building Trades. That's just a few of his titles, okay? We had to cut it short, okay? He is extremely politically active. His political action committee is the number one donor to black candidates in the state of Pennsylvania and has been responsible for ushering dozens of politicians to victory. His three passions are the development of young entrepreneurs, the community, and his family. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Nicole. What's going on? And nothing, nothing, nothing. So, okay, before I would let you go in and, and, and introduce yourself, I do want to say, first of all, his three passions are, that's very true. He is very passionate about the development of young entrepreneurs. He has taken me under his wing. I don't, like, I don't go around and just say this person's my mentor that person's my mentor because I don't play about that but Ryan is my mentor and he's definitely taking me under his wing he's very very passionate he's always looking to try and help better than success build and grow and I see him do it with countless other people he pours out pours out so trust me he's got some good 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 gems today so Ryan thank you for being my mentor and thank you for pouring into everyone the way you do thank you for pouring into people I see people as the give back and what I see out of you is nothing but positive vibes. And you never came on a selfish tip about me. It's how can we have a we and how can we move this community forward. Thank you so much, Ryan. You, know, you always want to bring, you always almost bring tears to my eyes. So, I just read off your bio. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Well, I don't, the bio doesn't tell who the man is. Uh, I'm a person that was born of two parents that loved me very much and cared about my education. I often say that the best thing that happened to me is I was born. I was born in the Richard Island Projects. 
Uh, so I, we had literally no money, but we had a lot of love. And my mother was passionate about my education. Uh, we put our nickels and dimes together to send me to Catholic school, which caused me to learn how to fight because I wore shoes every day. So when you come back through the hood and you have on shoes, you have to fight. <laughs> and my mom said, why don't you just catch the trolley in front of my house? I said, no, I'm going to catch it to broad and to ride and I'm going to walk. <laughs> because, you know, it was a certain uh, thing that you grew to learn, love about fighting is that people respected you. Mm -hmm. And I won my fair share. I lost some, but you know, you always gain the respect. And that respect is something that we still fight for today. Mm -hmm. And in my career, it has always been those fights that help me when, when things get down. I say, look, I'm, you know, here it is. I'm a poor kid from Richard Allen Project who raised up to actually meet President Obama in a private one on one meeting, not one of those photo lines where, you know, I was put in a position because of the team that surrounded me that, you know, I actually negotiated with President Obama. Mm -hmm. Prior to him being president, it's the coolest thing in the world, mm -hmm. man. I was thoroughly unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at him like he was a rock star. <laughs> and he out negotiated me because I was just like, I was in awe. I was in awe of the moment, but from that I learned that I could never be in awe of the moment again. Mm -hmm. Because when I walked out of there, I knew that I didn't give the people of Philadelphia the best representation. Mm. Uh, it was about some election day money. It was a small thing, but to me, I learned a great deal. Never be in awe because the people are more important than the people that's in the office. I don't care if he's the president of the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that journey took a long, winding road. You're talking about entrepreneurism. We, uh, my cousin, who's unfortunately no longer here, we were selling firecrackers at an early age, probably 11 or 12. And we were selling more firecrackers than the stores. So we went to Chinatown and we said, look, we can even sell more firecrackers if you don't sell to the stores in our neighborhood. And they did it. Now, I didn't know then that there was an exclusive distribution territory. I, know, that's right. I didn't know it. But that's what we, my cousin and I, negotiated that as 11 year old kids because. Instead of walking to the store, we was walking around the neighborhood, so we were selling triple the amount of firecrackers than the stores were selling. So we said, "Look, we can even, we can, we will be back here. You know, we, we them boys, man. We gonna sell." <laughs> and um, and we did that. So I've, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since selling papers. Like, you know, my father, I was twelve, and my father was like, "I don't give grown men money." I'm like, "Dang, I'm only twelve." <laughs> I asked him for some money for some sneakers. This is how it happened. The sneakers were sixty dollars, and my mom was notoriously cheap. What kind of sneakers were they? They were top ten Adidas. Okay. Back then, I remember like it was yesterday because it was. I had my windbreak. It was my sixth grade class trip. I was getting <laughs> fleeky, right? And he said, "Yeah, you can get those sneakers." I said, "Man, my pop must have hit a number. It was too easy." He came with one hundred and twenty inquiries. Inquiries at that time was a dollar a piece. He said, if you sell this 120, 60 is your profit, then you can re up next. I know that's right. Because then you pay 50, you know, you, you got half. I'm like, he knew it was no way in the world that if I sold those papers and worked for it, I was going to spend all my money on some sneakers. Uh, so I got the Kareem Abdul Jabbar, which was a little step down the Adidas, they had the leather strip, but it was only $45, and I put 15 in my pocket. But it taught me a lesson, and we always had stuff. My father had a, a store with his partner and his brother, Baha. They had, a, they had a store. We had to work at the store. My father had a quadplex. Anytime you ask for something, you're going to go clean out that quad. You're going to go see what they need. You gonna... So everything I've known was about entrepreneurship. My aunt, who was like, it's funny that that song, Reminisce Over You, I went ahead like my aunt Joyce. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my aunt Pat. She had, she had a salon. She lived in New Jersey. She had a Benz. I'm like, I don't want to work for nobody. I want my own. So fast forward, that cousin and I, when I left college, I left college a little early because I had a daughter I had to feed. And we said, look, we're going to go start this company, Princess. We're going to flip properties. You know, and, and that's what we did. But we made every mistake in the world. Mm -hmm. How old were you at the time? we still time? made money. I was 19. How many? Okay, so... Tell me about that process when you were flipping properties. How many properties did you guys end up doing? Well, we, we ended up doing uh, three together, uh, and then we just separated and, you know, did our own thing because we had different views of how business should be run. That's still my cousin, but he, 
uh, you know, he was one of the cheapest guys I've ever met in my entire life <laughs> to this day. He will argue them for a half a cent. <laughs> I said, look, we love each other. It's like my brother. But I don't have time if you're not my CFO, I can't do business with <laughs> you. Because, I mean, literally, we in, like, it's before Home Depot came out. I forget the name of it. It may have been Channel. And he's literally arguing with the lady over seven cents. I'm like, yo, let's get out of it. Like, no, seven cents off each piece of sheetrock. They had it advertised for this. And so, you know, I just had that type of energy. That's funny. But that's who he is. So, okay, so y'all did three flips together, and you were 19. I was 19. Wow. And when he died, uh, he had about... 17 units and he was only 46 years old mm. and he probably had a raw real estate portfolio of roughly six hundred and fifty thousand oh, dollars wow. that he left to his son so it's also about legacy mm -hmm. generational well. wealth see he didn't get married i got married and had a divorce so that <laughs> <laughs> divorces are very expensive oh, divorces are expensive so that, that's another tip for entrepreneurs pick your wife or your husband very wow. carefully because they are your business partner and don't listen to nobody well i'm just gonna get a prenuptial agreement Prenups don't carry nothing after you marry. It's only a prenuptial agreement. Is just what it says. Prenuptials before we take the nuptials. After you get married, the state of Pennsylvania say that that is your full 100% 50/50 partner, whether you want her to or him to or not. Mm. That is the law. I have a, a very close family member that took a big hit. You just big cut, hit. cut cut 50% of your money right in half. Well, Everything you make. 60 sometimes because if you make more and they have children, you know, and and, and listen. The way I look at it is, you know, my ex-wife, uh, you know, she, she raised my children. She's a, a beautiful mom, and she did give up a, a lucrative, possible lucrative career to follow my business. So after I got past the um, initial hurt of it, I understand that we can move on. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's talk about your vision. So you were young, you guys met, you had a vision. What was the vision that you had? And tell me about the process of actually bringing that vision into fruition. Well, the well, vision we had was we just wanted to control our neighborhood. We knew that our neighborhood, when I say our neighborhood, I mean that neighborhood between uh, 13th and 7th, between Gerard and Spring Garden. Okay. We knew that that neighborhood was very close to Center City. And we didn't know if it was going to be 15 years, 10 years, or 20 years. But we knew that that is very walkable. And we knew that that was going to be the next thing after uh, Art Museum area. Mm -hmm. So it was just our vision to take those properties and kind of make them better and, and either sell them or hold them and, and, and do those types of things. And we, we were, at that time, we were probably doing some things that we shouldn't have been doing, so we had access to a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like that we were <laughs> extremely intelligent or anything. We just had access to a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. you know, it was the, the 80s, you know, it was the late 80s, early 90s. You can imagine what was going on, and we were probably knee deep in that. And I, I lost a friend and changed my life. I said, "Look, this is not what I want to do. Mm. I want to straighten up and fly, fly right." And, and I've always been well educated, so I could just kind of go back to college, figure it out. And I had a great father who, you know had some connections and, and helped me out. So it's never about you. It's just, so that's why I give back, Nicole, because I did everything humanly possible to mess my life up. Mm -hmm. And if it ain't for the grace of the Creator, I would not be here. Mm -hmm. And I know that. So the miracle that is me, I try to voice that off on other people. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm a miracle. All my friends, every one of them, including the cousin that whom I love dearly, who's not here, 11 and a half years in the penitentiary. One friend, 20 years in the penitentiary. Another friend, life in the penitentiary. And not for killing, just for, you know, conspiracy to traffic narcotics. Mm -hmm. So when you get out of that, and it's not you, I wasn't any smarter than anyone else. It was just that that wasn't the path that the creator had put there for me. So I never looked back. Once I left, and I was 100% legit, I was 100% legit, and I had to shed some friends, and entrepreneurs need to learn that too. Mm -hmm. You have to shed people that bring you negative energy, and it's not just the normal negative energy, because I have friends also that people are like, why are you around me negative? I said, no, he's not, he makes sharp in my thinking. Everybody else is telling me that's a good idea, he's gonna tell me it's a bad idea, but he's gonna expound on why he thinks that a bad, that is a bad idea. I need that around me. Mm -hmm. I don't just need cheerleaders, you need people that's 
going to let you know the potential pitfalls because even if you do it, that sharpens up your thinking. So just because someone doesn't agree with you all the time don't mean that's negative energy, mm -hmm. right? That could be very positive. You don't want a bunch of people that's always going to tell you that you're right. You need somebody in a respectful manner to say, with all due respect, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And here's why you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I try to surround myself with those type of people and I lost, you know, relationships. I don't even call them friendships. They were just relationships that I had 20 years, 15 years, because they wasn't going in the direction I was going. And and when I started getting involved in the union, it was like, wow, this is something bigger than me. This is something that makes common folks that do heard. uncommon things. Oh, okay. I mean, if you look at the thing that Sam Senior set up called the Labor's Union, it's remarkable by any standard. So let's let's explain it, right? Like our listeners, they have no idea. They have no idea. They have no idea. I had the well, school. So you had an event yesterday. We had an event yesterday. And um, I went to the event. It was a political event. It was packed on a Sunday night. I the Sunday. I, I take my Sabbath on Sundays. Okay, that's just me. And so I. So you so you going against the Bible? No, the, we're not gonna get into this conversation. <laughs> we're not doing it. We're not doing it. And Brian always tries to get me into religion. I'm just saying the Ten Commandments is pretty clear. Keep Listen, the Sabbath holy. That's Saturday. I well, we do not, we it not, we on Sundays. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. But I came out yeah. yesterday. And it was and popping. It was, it was popping on a Sunday night, and so I had brought some of my friends with me, and so I had to kind of. I always like to put things into context so my friends know what they're walking into. So I had to explain to them because we were, we rode by the, the LDC main building mm -hmm. and then the, around the corner is a 332 mm -hmm. building. So I had to explain to them the whole setup and who you are. And of course I couldn't, I had to talk about Sam and yeah. what Sam's father did and all that. So I, get, I just gave this lesson yesterday, but I want you to give this lesson. Well, I, I'll, give the, I'll give the lesson. Uh, back, in the, back in the late 20s, uh, union construction workers were very hostile to black workers. We couldn't even walk down the stairs. We had to slide in the pile of sand. We were called the sand hogs. That's what we were called. Uh, a man founded us by the name of Harry Murray, a black man out of P Pittsburgh, founded a union. He wanted to get and unite all the black construction workers and put them under a banner so they could fight together against these racist oppressors to get better wages, better work conditions, and all that. He was successful at doing that. Sam takes over in about 1977, Sam's senior. And it was still, we didn't have respect. We didn't have, no one wanted to be a laborer. It was like, oh, Sam turned that around and now people want to be laborers. They want to wear the jacket. They don't mind because what he did was he made the contractors respect us. He brought us into the political arena and he made jobs with dignity. So when he took over, I think we were probably making in the $5 range. Today, our lowest rate on construction it's $29 an hour, mm. plus full benefits, full everything. And out of that, our members give a little bit to our PAC fund so that we can be politically involved, which makes us more powerful. The political, the PAC fund is the a political action political committee. Political action committee. Mm -hmm. And Sam started all that. We had none of that prior to him. So his visionary leadership, I stand on his shoulders. And my father was the secretary treasurer at 332, as well as the president prior to that. So... My father brought me into that, and, and, I, and I knew it from the outside. I knew that when my father, we was living in a project, and I remember my father got a, a union job, and we moved to Average Ford Avenue in Germantown, beautiful house. We moving up like the Jeffersons. Then like two years after that, we moved into his current house in Overbrook, which is like a six bedroom, three and a half bath, you know, mm -hmm. Backyard. I really thought I was rich, and it didn't take that long. So I knew what a good job did. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It, it, it gave people dignity. It gave you an identity. Because see, women, most of the times, they, they, they're somebody. But a man is who he is. Like if John is a dentist, John takes pride in that dental. If John is a lawyer, he's the lawyer, John. Or I'm a you know I'm a labor leader. That's who I am. Now we fully take our identity. Because we have to earn. We are the bread when it's, we should be most of the time. Now, you know, modern day, it's not like that. But women's careers has never defined them because other things define them, motherhood, sisterhood, and all that. But a man don't feel like a man unless he's earning. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first things that God did to man. He gave Adam a gig. Name all these animals, do all this, run that. That's a job. He gave him a job because we need to be needed as men. Mm -hmm. So 
That's why I like entrepreneurs because no one is going to give us jobs but us. Mm -hmm. Because they don't understand us. We have, we, we're complicated sometimes. And you go to corporate America and you have a 650 credit score, they make value judgments as you as a person. You know you can't get a corporate CEO job or any C-suite job if you got poor credit. Well, they don't know that you was taking care of your grandmother, your mom had a divorce, and just because you're the breadwinner out of the whole family, because with us, we don't have generations of success like me. If I'm the most successful one in my family, it's just not my nuclear family. My cousin gonna call me for rent, my niece, my aunt, all that. So when you outlay like that, sometime a bill may be late and they make value. But I know that Johnny or Nicole is a good person. I'm gonna give her a shot if I'm the CEO. But we have to start thinking about how do we get billion dollar businesses because we always give billion dollar ideas away. Mm -hmm. Shea butter. African Americans use shea butter in its raw form for years. Now, every product has shea butter in it. Now, why didn't we mass produce that on a level and sell it to Procter Gamble? Mm -hmm. Somebody else did it, it's not us. Mm -hmm. So we have things that we have in our community that we give away. Mm -hmm. Hair care. We are uh, maybe 97% of the end user, right, mm -hmm. of the product is African Americans. Mm -hmm. Yet we own less than 10% of the production of Synthetic hair, human hair, black hair care products, black skin care products. I see that changing though. I think why? You know, why? Well, why? I, I just see there's a huge renaissance in black women having these hair care lines. Carol's and all daughter that stuff. is one that started. Yeah. Who? Carol's daughter. Oh, Carol's daughter. Yes, but you just have a. I mean, I see it just being a. Uh, but the hairline, they're still the end user because they're not the manufacturer. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, we have a long way to go, for sure, for sure. I just think and that there was a renaissance, we, there's an awakening here. Well, we used to do that. We used to be the manufacturer. Madam C. Jane Walker, the first black female millionaire, was a millionaire because of black hair care products that she mass produced. You had Dudley's out of Chicago. You had, I mean, you had a lot of, that used to be our industry, as was dry cleaning our industry which is why they made the Jeffersons. He has seven dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. Those are industries that we have to take back because we control our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So entrepreneur, the reason why I like real estate, because you can sell real estate to sell a product. Ray Kroc, not the founder of McDonald's, but the, the stealer of McDonald's, because the founder was the McDonald's brothers. He stole it from them, and he started calling himself the founder. It's a real good documentary. What he realized and how he can make more money than them is that he was not in the hamburger business, he was in the real the estate, estate business. business. Mm -hmm. So what happens is he leases all that stuff and you gotta lease from him. So the first thing we have to do is control the real estate in our in our neighborhoods and then you start controlling the businesses because with the real estate control, you can also control what businesses you don't want. But if you don't mm -hmm. own it, you have to take everything. That's true, that's very yeah, true. Yeah, you can, if you own true. it, I don't, have to, I don't want to rent to a stop and go. I, I don't have to have a protest. I don't have to do anything, I just don't have to rent to you because I own and control the real estate. So my land use is what I want it to be as the owner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how do we control real estate and also how do we control capital? Self-directed IRAs. Mm -hmm. Within a self-directed IRA, I can lend you money to do a project. Mm -hmm. I've been working for years. Now, I can't take a disgorgement of my IRA, but I, if I do it right and it's an investment, I can make 10 or 15% and help you. So you don't have to go to the bank and buy you got a project. And let's say, it's a modest project. You only need 200000 I know many people, we know many people that have been working 20 years that got three and 400000 in the IRA. Lend me the 200000 I'll give you 10% on it. And I can self-direct that to you as an investment, make my 10%, you give me my money and come back, and it's not a loan, there's no penalty or anything, because you can grow 100% of profits in your IRA, but you can only contribute a certain amount. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are the things that we need to share, creative financing, where we can do business with one another, where we don't have to go to the bank, and then maybe next time you can go to the bank, because you did that project, but it's that one project that you have to get off the ground, and we can do that ourselves. We don't need to go to people if we work together. That is why I was so gung ho about your Better Than Success Women in Real Estate Summit because it was putting all those people together. And when you see collaborations happen, that's 
when real business is done, mm -hmm. not these mom and pops. Because what we have to realize, we have to understand where we are. The average black business has one employee. 95% of black business have one employee, mm. which means you just created a job for yourself. You're really not in business. Right. Now, I, don't hate, I hate to say that to people. They're like, you being arrogant. No. Until you can make money while you're in the south of France, you don't have a business. You have a job. Because mm -hmm. businesses create wealth and jobs for other people. Mm -hmm. So we have to think on a bigger scale. We have to learn how to use great attorneys to go through our mistrust. So if, even if, whether I know you or not, you have a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. Let's do business together. Let's do a joint venture. Why do I have to trust you if I got a attorney, a, attorney with a protect, document? Right. You have to protect yourself with structures because that's what they do. The convention center was built with the number one construction company in the country and number three. They compete on everything. They don't like two knowledge bases married together to make a job that was on time, not under budget. And then once the job mm -hmm. was over, they dissolved the joint venture, and now we're going back to competing. But when we needed each other to make this money, we did that. So now these are arch business enemies, but they're not personal enemies, but they, you know, they compete. We have to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. Because until we do that, we can't build black billionaires. I want a black billionaire that I know. Because if you get a billionaire that you know, it, you, it, 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 it leverages certain things when you have a company like Comcast. And Comcast story is a regular business story. They used to be Adelphia Cable, Suburban Cable. They, when, when Mayor Rendell took over as mayor, they were worth like $8.3 million. And the, 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 the person that they had to partner with, because Wilson Goodstein was real smart, he made, if you had cable in Philadelphia, you either had to have Comcast or whatever, now Comcast, and then it was Wade Cable, which was a black outfit, and they split the city in half. Comcast wound up buying uh, Wade out at a decent number. They made some money, but they didn't. But they saw the thing. So Rendell then becomes, at this mayor, he becomes the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, which takes him all over. He takes Comcast all over the country and introduced them to markets that they would have never saw. They started buying little cable outfits and those. And then when he left governor, that eight that the eight point three million dollar company was able to buy NBC when he left governor of Pennsylvania. Mm. That's the power of politics. So when people say that politics don't work, you gotta make it work for you. Mm -hmm. That was his company, his pet project. Let me take it because guess what? It made it's good to have a Pennsylvania based Philadelphia-based corporate headquarters of a multi-billion dollar company because they could do philanthropic stuff, it's jobs, all and of jobs. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense, but we have to do that. We don't have a black company like that. We don't. It's our biggest black company, PRWT, and they probably got 200 employees. What's PRWT? You don't even know them, see? They do, they do facilities maintenance. They're a big company, though. Owned by a guy by the name of Willie Johnson, former social worker, great entrepreneur. He's older, so he's uh, passing it on to a brother named Malik Majid, a uh, Harvard-trained lawyer. So, I mean, he's good black people. Mm. You should get to know him. I will. Well, so, I'm going to tell you a real quick funny story, and then I want to kind of piggyback off of some of that stuff that you're talking about. So, first of all, Ryan said, it's like, you know, I really want to get back behind the, the Women in Real Estate Summit, so I'm going to tell you a funny story. For those of you who are not there, Ryan did the opening remarks. He introduced me, he gave the most, I said, I got to bring him with me everywhere I go because he gave the best introduction of me ever. And um, so how he even ended up doing it, we put out the uh, agenda to the public for women in real estate. And we were going to have a comedian do the emceeing in the opening remarks. So I said, we got a special guest. I had really talked to the comedian. We didn't lock it up yet, but I knew I was going to have somebody do it. And so, um, Brian called me, he's like, yo, because, so I put op opening remarks, special guest. So he's like, I was like, hello? He's like, hey, I'm doing the opening remarks. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically yeah. how the conversation yeah. went. I was like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a chance to laugh. Like, I think that we have enough entertainment and people always want to mix our entertainment with business. You know, it's not a chance to laugh. For that reason, but I'm very, very, very particular about 
who I allow to have say-so in my life and who I keep around me. And you are one of those people. I can probably only say about maybe five people that I trust their judgment just as much as I trust my own. So, like, anybody else that I fool with, if they would have called me just outside those five people, like, yeah, I'm going to do this, I would have had a million questions. Yeah, no, you're not that. doing it. I, I just saw you in <laughs> You see, right, exactly. Then I'm like, okay, we need to have a meeting. This is how this is going to go. When you blink twice, then you <laughs> take a deep breath here, yeah. right? So then when Ryan said it, yes, okay, yes, sir, sir, yes, sir. At first I didn't realize it. And then I, I thought about it after I was like, this is really a big deal. Because my really good friend Ryan said he wants to do this and he wants to get behind us. He believes in this this much. And a Saturday mornings in the fall, I don't come out for anyone. That is my son's football and I and, and I enjoy watching him play. <laughs> <laughs> but you came out for us now. We appreciate it. Uh, you know what it is, Nicole, you just said you're five people. That is your personal board of directors. Mm -hmm. Every entrepreneur should have their personal board of directors. And you don't have to know them. See, the problem is people want to know everybody. If you see someone that is doing things that you want to do, get to know that person and ask them to commit to one meeting a quarter. Usually people can do it. And you get all of them together, and what you do is you quiz them, and that becomes your personal board of directors. You can run things by them. You can call them. And people like to help other people. People always say people don't want to help. People do, but they just want to help people that are serious. Yes. They don't want to help people that are shopping for an answer that they like. And the worst thing that you can do to a successful person is ask them something. And then tell them, well, my friend said that's less successful than them <laughs> to do it this way. And then they're just going to tell you, you know what? Do it the way your friend said. <laughs> don't come back to no, no advice. Back I ain't got time for this. Like, yeah. Because if I'm running a billion-dollar portfolio, and Johnny, who never got anything, but he was reading everything on the Internet, tell you something. And you equate that, you don't have good discernment, and I don't have time to waste on you if you don't have good discernment. But if you're really trying to do something, look at that. Ask people seriously. You don't ask them to impose on them monthly. That is, a, that is an imposition that nobody's, but quarterly, people say, you know what, this person is serious. And when you meet with them quarterly, because successful people are very busy, you're only going to have an hour. Be prepared with all the questions. Write them down and then be prepared to follow up and write it if they have to get back to you. Don't just go and try to go off or uh, fly off the cuff. No, within those three months, get some thought-provoking questions that you really want the answers to because one thing about uh, successful people, too, they're resourceful, and they know that if I don't know it, I have a phone, right? Because it's not just I. I have a wonderful, phenomenal team around me that I couldn't do anything without. So it's never about I, it's about we. And I hate people say, well, I'm just a perfectionist. Well, if you're a perfectionist and you didn't get anywhere yet and you're in your 40s, what is that? Well, maybe you're not perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So you need some advice. And sometimes you need to look at it from a different vantage point. I do that all the time. I mean, we, when, when Governor Wolf appointed me to the, be the chairman of the Delaware River Port Authority, Everybody was like, oh, you, you know, you're going to fire everybody today? I said, I don't even know what a bathroom is. <laughs> and everybody thought we were moving deliberate. It took us three months to make changes. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to give people a chance to be themselves. And then we found out we had a plan, and we moved forward. But it was through consultation with a group of people to say, if we do this, what will happen? It wasn't just a dictate fiat by me. We need to know. What does this, what's this person's strengths and weaknesses? And we have to be able to do that in a very dispassionate manner because business is war. And the biggest thing that I think that African Americans don't understand is the concept that business is war and it is a zero-sum game. If I win, you lose. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. In business, if I win, you lose. If, if it's not the case, ask Sears. Walmart beat them at war. Mm -hmm. What about Amazon beating Walmart right now? And Amazon is now beating Walmart. And when Walmart's now rearming and and they're coming up on their online division. And now they're making employees deliveries to home and all that. So now people don't just give up at war, but it's war. It is, high. It is because people have a finite amount of dollars. And why should I spend my money with you? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we go into business thinking that we got the best product, and we get mad at the customer don't like our stuff. No, you have to understand. And another thing, please, 
get, get real, real surveys to understand how is your customer service for real. Not just what your friends are saying. Not, oh, she don't like it because she a hater. No. And, and about your product. Get real feedback. The biggest thing that people pay Nielsen for, my son interned in Nielsen, he said, Dad, Nielsen is not a rating service. I said, well, what is it? I thought it was always a rating service. He said, no, they gather the most research and they sell research on customers. That is what they do. That is their core business model. That your, your viewing habits is only one part of your habits. They sell your habits, your demographic information, whether you like latte or anything. That's, so companies need to know that so they know the target market. And sometimes you have to fit your brand and what you're doing into the market as, as opposed to you making the market react to you. Mm -hmm. Price points are another thing that we have to study. We have to understand what's the price point. I asked the woman, she said, I'm selling dinners. I said, you're selling them for what? I'm selling them for $15. I said, why? How much profit do you make off the of $15? Why? Well, I don't know. Mm -mm. If you don't know how much a platter costs and the plate and all that, how do you know if $15 is too much or not enough? Right. Or And your time. Your time. Yeah, your time. Because you have to put in your time for that. I yeah, told, next thing you know, you're looking up, you, you think about it, you're working for $3 an hour. My wife had a consignment shop. The biggest argument we've ever had because she said, I don't believe in her. I said, baby, I love you. You went to school. You have a master's degree. You have advanced credits. You're a marriage and family therapist. Your hourly rate is 125. What I want you to do is add up all the sales that you make in here on a Saturday, which is your good day, and divide it by the amount of hours you was here. And then we get home. And once she did it, two weeks after that, we closed it down. <laughs> it was not a successful business. Right. And she was working for less than ten dollars an hour. So even your good day was a bad day. You can do that with way less stress. You can do that with less stress. You want to make $10 an hour. Yeah, but you need to learn and understand. Because unless you use a hobby. If you like a hobby, like, you know, I have an aunt. She likes making flowers, and she'll give them to you. You know, that's what she'll do. She, she's not going to try to make a business out of it. It's the difference between a business and a hobby. Mm -hmm. We need to know the difference. Mm -hmm. And we need to do business, not cut corners, not, well, I'm going to try to avoid taxes. Because I'm going to tell you why paying taxes is a good thing. I love this conversation. You have to pay tax because you have to show income because so when you go to loans. so when you can get some loans so you can make money with other people's money. Because nobody gonna give you money if they don't have a reasonable expectation on how they're gonna get paid back. And they can't say, Well look, well really I made eighty thousand, but I ain't wanna declare because I don't want Uncle Sam. Well no. Just pay Uncle Sam. No, if you, you cheat Uncle into, Sam, you're gonna cheat me. Right. If you can't factor that into the, the cost of doing business, then the fight promoter, Don King, used to always throw a party on April the 15th. And, uh, and people say, Don, why do you throw a party when you have to pay taxes? He said, man, because if I had to pay $50 million in taxes, could you imagine how many profits I made? <laughs> and he said, this country put the environment together for me to make it, so I'm celebrating it. Right. And if you look at it from those different lenses, looking at it out of someone else's window, we can do that. But until we get together and go to professional seminars and understand that investing in ourselves is important, we can't do anything. Because although you had 200, there should have been 500 people there. Because it's not just about real estate, it's about business techniques that are transferable to any industry. Mm -hmm. When I go to my continuing education, they had one in Vegas the same time you had yours. While you had 200, they had 22,000. Mm, I can't wait till we get there. I know we, I didn't. At 1,700 for registration. I, I can't wait till we get there. I know we can. 17,000. I mean, 1,700. You don't get lunch. You get the content. Lunch is on your own. You might get a continental breakfast, right? That's it. Because the content is worth it. Right. So we're going to get there. But you know what? Sometimes it's better to be smaller. Less is more. Would you say less is more? I just didn't know it was going to be there. I just didn't know it was going to be there, but... Well, I did. I, I had all the faith because your passion and your energy, that translates into another vibe and people see that you're real and you're bringing the content experts to them. You're not holding them or hoarding them to yourself like it's only one deal. And you say, look, I'm going to take the best credit person. I'm going to take some creative finance and I'm going to take some people that's doing great things. And not only am I going to help you education, but I'm going to inspire you to know that if I could do it, you could do it. 
I know if I can do it, me, little, short, fat guy from North Philly, to achieve the things that I did, worked hard, anybody could do it. There's nothing special about me. I had special parents, I had special people around me, I had special opportunities, but I'm not special. Find out who's really for you and push yourself. The one thing that Sam State Senior did to me is every opportunity he gave me was maybe a little bit behind my reach and I had to jump to get it. And I did, I jumped to get it. And it was just like that meeting with the president. It was a little behind my reach that time, but better believe the next time when I met with Joe Biden, I won that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I had so much more than I wanted to say and share, but we're running out of time. I, I, I knew it was going to be like this. So, okay, let's wrap up here. Um, this, real quick, one parting piece of advice for entrepreneurs. Get your personal board of directors. Use your personal board of directors and be an expert in your industry. Read everything, go to every seminar, go to the library to check out books. You don't have to buy books. But if, you, if you're going to be an expert in flipping, be an expert in flipping. If you're going to be an expert in hair care, be an expert in hair Don't follow any trend. Be an expert in that which you are focusing on. You should be the content knowledge expert in that. Mm -hmm. Great piece of advice. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> this was I'm awesome. I wish we had more time. I wish we had more time. So, it's... <laughs> I can't, I'm, when we get offline, I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all probably going to be like, what is she talking about? I want to share something with you, and I want to. Um, I want you to get involved in terms of, like, content and advice and all that. And um, we'll talk about that. So, you guys, thank you. Of course, you know it's going to be probably maybe a week or two before I even share this idea that I had. Um, so, but anyways, thank you guys for tuning in. I know this just blessed your whole week, month. You got a lot to think about. You really, really, really do. And I want you to start taking some notes. I want you to write some things down. And without knowing it, Ryan talked a lot about some of the principles in the book, The Anti-Hustle. So make sure you get The Anti-Hustle at theantihustlebook.com. And um, be sure to hit the subscribe button and make sure that you give us a five-star rating and write a review. So go to betterthansuccess.com forward slash iTunes if you have an iPhone or betterthansuccess.com forward slash Google if you have an Android and you hit that subscribe button, give us a five-star rating and write us a review. And until next time, you guys, happy entrepreneuring. That was good.